What is going on guys, my name is John and welcome back to yet another video. Earlier this week, Pokemon Sword and Shield was updated to include what is presumably the final expansion added before the next mainline games, the Crown Tundra, an expansive winter location home to some returning Pokemon as well as some brand new faces. Naturally being the curious person that I am, I want to see just how difficult it would be to catch every Pokemon in one game. Today we're going to find out how easy you can complete Professor Oak's challenge in Pokemon Sword and Shield's Crown Tundra DLC. Now, if you've seen the one that I did in the Isle of Armor a few months back, it's obviously not as difficult as the standard Professor Oak's challenge with the base game. However, I kind of now see these DLC challenges as a solo catch em all, and as a result, I try to use my very limited knowledge of the area at the moment to learn how to catch everything as fast as possible. If you have no idea what a Professor Oak challenge is, you can check out the playlist of my other videos in the top right of your screen to better understand what we're trying to achieve here. Regardless, let's go over the rules. The first rule is we would obtain every Pokemon available before each gym badge. Like I said earlier, because we've already completed the story when we did the base game, this is more so just a catch em all, but it's still a very lengthy challenge. The second rule is that we can only use one copy of the Gen 8 games. This means that any trade evolutions or version exclusives won't be obtained, but this is just so the challenge is consistent regardless of who chooses to attempt it. The final rule is that no glitches can be used. If you know by now, there are basically zero glitches aside from the raid dens, but it's still important to note in case that changes over time. Before we get into the video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more content like this. Only about 30% of the viewers that watch my content are actually subscribed, and if you don't like what I upload, you can always change your mind down the road. With all that out of the way, let's just jump right into it. So if you've caught up on our Professor Oak Challenge for Shield, you know that we ended the Isle of Armor with a whopping 470 Pokemon between the base game and the first DLC. While the first game was branded around expanding with returning older Pokemon, this DLC was promoted as the area of exploration. While that may come off as there being more story and less Pokemon, if I'm not mistaken there are actually more Pokemon in this than the Isle of Armor, so this will definitely still be quite a challenge. Unlike the previous challenges, we're going to try and catch every new Pokemon in the Crown Tundra decks as fast as possible, so a real challenge is going to be hoping our RNG luck is better than it usually is. To start our journey, we head to Wedgehurst Station and talk to the Teller again to direct us to the Crown Tundra. Once we arrive, we're greeted by the Professor's Assistant, who upgrades our Pokedex once again to contain another separate Pokedex for this new area. Outside we meet Peony and his daughter Peonia, and after watching them argue for a few minutes, he challenges us to a battle. After the dust settles, we find that Peonia has run off towards the max lair, and he instructs us that we should follow along to try and find her. At this point, we're able to roam around the initial few areas, but for now we can take care of a couple encounters within the slippery slope. Here we can catch Smoochum, Jinx, Amora, and Cryogonal, who will oddly be very useful later on. Inside the max lair, we find Peony arguing with the attendant, and he heads straight into the dens to find his daughter. To no surprise, we have to chase after him, which brings us straight into the biggest attraction of the DLC, Dynamax Adventures. In this game mode, you fight waves of Dynamax Pokemon before fighting a final legendary Pokemon at the end of the den. During this time, you're only allowed to use rental Pokemon, and thankfully they're significantly better than the computer players that you team up with in the base game. I'm looking at you, Solrock. Although there are some new Pokemon here, they're all actually not available in the base Pokedex or even the Crown Tundra, but we'll talk more about these special Pokemon and the legendaries like Suicune later on. After clearing the den, we have a quick conversation before never seeing her again, and exit the den to check back on Peony. After finding out that he died, we revive him and he tells us that since his daughter doesn't want to spend time with him, we're forced to be his new son and go on an inventor, which requires us to go around the region to solve the Tundra's many mysteries. From here, we have to follow him to the next town, and on the way I was able to catch Audino, bringing the total to 475 Pokemon. At the entrance to Freezing Tin, we meet the mayor of the town, whose name is literally Mayor, and we're told about the area's history, including the mysterious statue in the center of the town. At Peony's house, he initiates us into the program and gives us three legendary clues that he wants us to investigate. These tasks are essentially the core parts of the DLC, and the best part is that we can take these on in basically any order that we like. However, one of them is technically the main storyline, so it's best to challenge that first. In addition, Peony gives us a uniform as well as a Master Ball, which is an enormous help if we need to catch all these legendaries in the clues. After inspecting Peony's pillow on his dining table, we find that it seems to be the top of the head for the statue in the town, and we head there to try and fit it back into place. Once we restore the statue, we're greeted by the actual Pokemon and follow it into woods to battle. After this, the Pokemon possesses Peony and uses his body to talk through him to thank us for giving back his comically large head, and he tells us that his name is Calyrex. It explains that it was the king of this land, however, over time people have forgotten it and don't know the history of its impact on the tundra. After being forced to remind literally everyone in town, Calyrex mentions that the horse portion of the statue is formerly its steed, and we're tasked with figuring out how to track this Pokemon down. Out of all the people, it's best to assume that the mayor would know the most, so we leave the town to try and track him down to find out where it could be. As we're leaving Freezington, we meet up with Sonia and talk to her about some special footprints that were found by the gate. This is based around a completely different part of the story, so we'll come back to that a little bit later. Now let's catch some Pokemon. 
Just like the Isle of Armor, this location is loaded with brand new Pokemon to Sword and Shield, and a large portion can be encountered in the overworld, which saves a lot of time having to grind them up. Here we can catch Nidoran male, Nidorino, Nidoking, Nidoran female, Nidorina, Nidoqueen, as well as Aerodactyl in the sky. I kind of brushed over this earlier with Amora, but all of the fossil Pokemon are available in the overworld in the Crown Tundra, which is a pretty underrated addition for how cool it is to find them. At the garden we find the mayor, and he tells us to meet him back at his house in Freezington to learn more about Calyrex and how the two are related. After reading some of the books, we remind Calyrex that his steed loves crops, most importantly carrots, which is probably the key to tracking it down. Although crops don't grow here without Calyrex's powers, the farmer of the town still has the seeds to the plants, and if we trade him the Dynite Ore that we earned from the Suicune raid from earlier, we can trade those to get the carrot seeds that we need. Upon giving them to Calyrex, it tells us that we have to plant the seeds in one of the two gardens within the tundra, which results in which seed appears in the story. This is one of the very few choice-based Pokemon in this DLC, and for a challenge like this, it doesn't really matter which one you pick because they're both very powerful Pokemon if you choose to use it. Because I ended up going with the Ice Garden in my personal playthrough, I headed to the Old Cemetery to collect the opposite Pokemon. Once we plant the seed, Calyrex grows the plant with the power of dance, and conveniently we have attracted his noble steed, Spectrier. Upon heading back to Freezington, we have an encounter with the Pokemon, and once we defeat it, we collect a strand of its hair to bring to Calyrex. In order for it to tame the horse again, we bring that and a petal to the mayor, and eventually Peony, to create a pair of reins. We're told by Calyrex that with these two items, we can head to the Crown Shrine at the top of the area to lure Spectrier, so we make our way there to finish the largest part of the story. As we're heading there, we obviously have a ton of new Pokemon that we have to collect, so let's take some time to go over those. On the snow slide slope, we can catch Beldum, Magby, Magmar, Magmortar, and Aurorus through a few weather changes, which brings us to the tunnel connecting us to the beginning of the area. In the tunnel to the top, we can catch Carbink, Zubat, Golbat, Gibble, and finally Absol right outside the cave. At the Crown Shrine, we meet Calyrex and place the carrot in its old pen and wait out until it arrives. After having a quick rodeo, Calyrex has retamed Spectrier, and as thanks, Calyrex allows us to take it on in its true form to add to the team. For the first time in the history of my challenge videos, we can catch two Pokemon in one Pokeball, and also have an extremely strong Pokemon that we can carry through the rest of the DLC. After a few throws, we can add both to the total. Now that we've completed this section of the story, we can return to PE and start the second section of the event tour. Throughout every corner of the tundra, there are temples that have been sealed off for centuries, and it's up to us to figure out how to solve the puzzles to allow us to go inside. The first one is located in the giant's bed right below Freezington. If we stand outside the front and whistle, the door will open and allow us inside. Even looking at the outside, it's pretty obvious that these are the Regis from Hoenn, but in comparison, these are significantly more difficult to fight due to how much higher level they are than they've been in the past. In this room, we can encounter Registeel, which brings the total of 495 Pokemon. Heading back to the slippery slope, we can head left to find the next ruined location. This one says that it requires you to walk with the living crystal of snow. This is referencing Cryogonal, and thankfully they're literally all over the region, so once we add it to the front of our party, we can walk right in. This allows us to catch Regice, who was the shortest encounter with only having to throw two dust balls. The Vile Regie is located on the opposite side of the giant's bed. This puzzle requires your lead Pokemon to hold the never-changing stone, which is actually the Everstone. Inside we can capture Regirock, which completes this section of the story right? Well, as a bonus to the DLC, we can head to the east side of the map to catch another special Pokemon. But before we get there, there is a bunch of new locations with a ton of Pokemon to collect. At the giant's foot, we can catch Swablu, Altaria, and Archon, the version exclusive Kabuto and Kabutops in the Roaring Sea Caves, and Tortuga, Sveal, Celio, and Walrein in the Frigid Sea, which gives us over 500 Pokemon available for this challenge. At the final ruins, it asks for each of the three Regis to be present in the party, and with that we can enter the Split Decision Ruins. With a name like that, it's pretty obvious that we can only take one of the Pokemon in this location, and we select it by lighting the eyes based on which one that we prefer. For this game, I chose to catch Regilecki, and with a single quick ball, we finish the second story for the game. Now that we can report this whole section to Peony, we can work on the third and final clue challenge that we receive from him. This requires us to venture to the most southern area at Balamir Lake. Before we take care of the main quest, let's grab a few more encounters. Here we can get Tyrant, Tyrantrum, Anarith, Relicanth, and Dratini in the water. If we head to the enormous berry tree in the center of the lake, we're confronted by the three Galarian birds who have a quick fight before leaving in all different directions. Peony tells us that these three Pokemon are now roaming about in each of the three sections of this game. The mainland of Galar, the Isle of Armor, and the Crown Tundra. Before we hunt those down, let's finish up catching the last area of Pokemon before heading in that direction. In the lakeside cave, we can catch Aeron, Lairon, and Agron, which brings a total to 515 Pokemon. So since we're already in the Crown Tundra, let's just grab that bird first. Each of the birds will roam in sort of a pattern around the world, and if you ride around for a bit, you'll eventually come across it. 
The catch though is that each one has some characteristic that makes it difficult to catch, so you kinda have to plan for them to run into you rather than the other way around. For Articuno, I found that it's best to fly the Registeel Ruins and head up towards Freezington. Articuno will usually follow that path and end up right above you to set up the encounter. Thankfully, unlike the other roamers in history's past, they don't flee upon encountering them, so they're more so just kind of annoying to track down. After a few balls, we can add Articuno to the total. Next up is my personal favorite, as you can tell by the thumbnail, Zapdos. This one appears in the wild area, and the goal is to chase it around and around until it gets tired and is slow enough to run into with your bike. Because that takes too long, I found a way to almost encounter it instantly. If you chase after it until it reaches the stairs leading to Motostoke, you can fly into that location and boost your bike to the right to immediately encounter it. This can take a couple tries, but if you're fast enough, you can just fly back to the spot again before it leaves and keep trying until you get it. This Pokemon ended up being the longest to catch, but it's well worth it for a Pokemon this cool. I mean, come on, look at it. The Final Bird is located all around the Isle of Armor, and this is by far the most difficult Pokemon to track down. Not only is it extremely fast, but the path it takes is really confusing, but I found a super consistent method to track it down. If you spot the station at the Fields of Honor and race to the hill by the dojo, Moltres will literally fly right to you. On my first time playing, I originally tried to race it down across the region, but this hasn't failed me yet, so I definitely recommend giving this a shot. With that, we've completed every story in the DLC, so we must be done, right? Well, not exactly. After returning to Peony, we have a quick interaction with him and his daughter, and are given a few rewards for completing his inventor. As we try to leave, we check out a note on the floor that Peony dropped that we're supposed to return to him in the Max Lair. Before we do that, let's finish up the rest of the encounters for the Tundra decks. Although Peony doesn't tell us to do this, there is technically another legendary quest that we have to go on. If you remember from earlier in the challenge, Sonia wants to observe a bunch of footprints that were scattered across the Crown Tundra, and there are three different sets of tracks that we have to hunt down. Thankfully, unlike the Diglett from the Isle of Armor, there isn't a finite amount of these, so you don't need a guide to make sure you find each and every single one. On the flip side, the white tracks are by far the most difficult ones to find because of how well they blend in with the scenery. The other two are brown and blue, which is super easy to spot from a distance, but personally you'll probably spend the most time hunting this specific color down. During this grind, I spent a little time catching the remaining Pokemon that I missed, so we can add Elekid, Electabuzz, Electivire, Lilip, and Crobat who evolved partway through catching these. After finding 50 of each, we can head back to Sonya, and she'll confirm that these tracks are related to the Swords of Justice, who can now be found in specific locations in the overworld. If we head to the Frigid Sea, we can catch Cobalion, Terrakion in the Lakeside Caves, and finally Verizion at the Giant's Bed. As you know, these have a catch rate of 3, so they're going to be just as difficult as every other legendary we've encountered, so it's important to- Oh my god. Yeah, so coincidentally the last Pokemon that I had to catch for the decks happened to be a shiny, and from what I've been told the odds aren't boosted for these Pokemon at all, so I found a full-out shiny Verizion in one encounter. Maybe my luck is finally turning around. I kinda panicked so I just used my Master Ball from Peony, which gives us a total of 526 Pokemon. Now let's take care of the most important part, the grinding section. Thankfully because Sonia gives you a ton of EXP candies for finishing that task, this is pretty easy to do. It's also important to note that basically every Pokemon is obtainable in the overworld, so the grinding for this section is almost non-existent. With this we can evolve Gibble to Gabite, Gabite to Garchomp, Beldum to Matang, Matang to Metagross, Archon to Archaeops, Tortuga to Caracosta, Anorith to Armaldo, Lilip to Cradilly, Dratini to Dragonair, and Dragonair to Dragonite. With that we've successfully completed the Professor Oak's challenge for Crown Tundra, but there is still technically more that we can do here. Now this is part of the challenge where it's kind of a gray area. At the end of the day, the main goal is to complete your Pokedex before each gym, and the Pokemon that we're going to take a look at are catchable, but they don't appear within any of the Pokedexes in the game. If you've looked into Sun and Moon's Professor Oak, it's the same issue with the Island Scan Pokemon and the Ultra Wormholes. As far as I know, these aren't counted for the challenge, but I still think that it's important to know because of how much they're related to the DLC. Before we jump into that, let's talk about two specific Pokemon. If we head back into the Roaring Sea Caves, we can talk to this woman who will weave Galerica Twigs to give us the evolution for the other Pokemon in the Galarian Slowpoke line. Although this isn't in the Crown Tundra decks, this is actually in the Isle of Armor for some reason, so I guess this is part of the challenge? Finally, if you explore the map online and talk to 32 different people while you're in the Crown Tundra and head back to the Balamir Lake, you can encounter Spiritomb. The only reason I didn't do this is because technically you're using other games to obtain this, and the premise of this challenge is to do it offline without any other games. So this is once again a Pokemon that I'm not sure if it belongs in the challenge or not. Now let's talk about the Max Lair. 
If we head back there, we can return the letter to Peony, which will unlock the last expansion for the Crown Tundra. Since we've technically completed the DLC story, when we now attempt Dynamax Adventures, you have a chance to encounter Ultra Beasts in addition to the Legendaries, which expands the list by another 10 Pokemon. As you're making your way through the raids, you can encounter every legendary Pokemon in the series' history, excluding a few that can be obtained in different areas of the Crown Tundra. In total, there are 47 different legendaries that you can fight, however, there are some version exclusives that only allow you to catch 40, which is a lot of work anyways if you want to complete this section. In addition, all of the Hoenn starters are catchable, which adds another 9 Pokemon to the total after breeding them. Finally, if you complete enough raids, you can be given Poipole, which you can then evolve into Naganadel, which will give you a total of 589 Pokemon. The next Pokemon is actually kind of an easter egg which involves you going back to Sonia to report on capturing all the Swords of Justice. If we head back to Balamir Lake and surf to the island, we can find a set of footprints next to this pot behind the tree. If we cook some curry through the Pokemon camp, once we exit we can encounter a wild Keldeo. This is the only time that this Pokemon has been catchable in the series history, so this is by far one of the coolest additions in this DLC. The final Pokemon that we can take a look at is back in Freezington. If we talk to the Cosmog that's in the corner of this house, the woman will offer it to us, and after training it up, we can also evolve it into Cosmoem. With all these Pokemon, we have a new technical total of 592 Pokemon, and all the Pokemon that are available within the Crown Tundra. And with that, we've successfully completed Professor Oak's challenge in the second Sword and Shield DLC. But how did I do? So let's review. Like I said earlier, my goal was to try and do this as fast as possible, and I think I did a pretty decent job. In total, this expansion took me around 4.5 hours to complete the Crown Tundra decks, but with some more optimization, I'm sure you could do this in 3 hours or less. For those who are interested in trying this out for themselves, I've included some links in the description, and I'll also be updating my Pokemon Home Guide soon to add all these Pokemon if you're also trying to finish that living decks. I know this is unrelated to the challenge, but I genuinely feel this is one of the best things that Pokemon has done in a while. I really love the base game for Sword and Shield, but this expansion really built on what was good and bad about Gen 8, and I think this is a fantastic ending to this part of the generation. If you're on the fence about it, I can confidently say that this alone is worth the $30, so if you're on the fence about Isle of Armor, this definitely seals the deal for me. Other than that, that's all there is to say about completing Professor Oak's challenge in Pokemon Sword and Shield's Crown Tundra DLC. And that's going to do it for today's video. If you liked the video, leave a like and consider subscribing, as I'll be making more content like this very soon. If you have any other suggestions for videos that you'd like to see, leave a comment below. Follow me on Twitter to keep updated with new videos as they come out. If you're interested in watching me take on challenges live, I've been streaming a lot over my Twitch account that you can find in the description. Other than that, like thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.